Hello world, it's me. So after we how to talk to that 82 or 8154 IO chip, now it's time to look at this Z80 and see if it's running and, and make sure that it's working okay. With the Z80, there's uh, six lines here that are of critical importance. Without these six lines being connected properly, the Z80 isn't gonna do anything. And that's in addition to the power and ground. So of course, we've gotta have our five volts and we gotta have our ground. Once we have confirmed that we've got five volts and ground, so those will be one of the first things we check, we then need to look at the clock. The clock, of course, is critical importance. If it doesn't oscillate, the Z80 isn't going to move at all. We check the clock, we make sure we've got a good clock, and then we need to look back at these other lines. And you know, we had these jumpers that we thought had a trace in the back that were connecting them to the five volts, but as it turns out those aren't connected. And so let's basically look at these input lines that are critical. We've got the reset line. And if that is low, this processor will stay in reset. So the clock will still tick away, but the processor itself would not do anything because it would stay in reset. It would constantly be going back and fetching instruction zero over and over again. So the reset line has to be at logic one. There's the interrupt and the non maskable interrupt. And if if those are both high, the processor will go on. But if either of those are low, the interrupt one, we can mask if we have disabled the interrupts, but the non-maskable interrupt, that's like the, the trap on the 8085. We can't mask that at all. So if that one goes low, the Z80 will continue to service that interrupt and it'll just get stuck in a little loop where it's constantly servicing that interrupt. But even while it's servicing that interrupt, if, if either of those are low, either interrupt or the non-maskable interrupt, we will see the processor cranking away, but it's, it's going to get stuck. It's just stuck in this one spot. It's trying to reservice that interrupt and it can't progress. The weight is a more critical one. If the weight input is low, the processor will just stop doing everything. The clock will still continue, but it will stop incrementing and it'll stop fetching instructions. So if weight is going low, we would see that M1 would not be toggling because it's not fetching new instructions. It's just held held in one spot. And the other one is the bus request. If it goes low, that's there if somebody else needs to take over, if you've got more than one processors or you have or you have DMA or something like that. And so somebody else is taking control of the bus. That's the purpose of the bus request where someone else is requesting the bus at that point, the Z80 will go into a wait state and all of the outputs will go into a try state so that somebody else can be controlling the address. So we simply need to start from the basics. We need to first look at the clock. We need to look at the wait. We need to look at the interrupts and the bus requests and make sure those are all operational. All of the outputs right now, we don't care what they are. We'll, they'll sort themselves out after we demonstrate that this processor is actually doing something. So first of all, let's look at the clock and see if the clock is working. So I'm not seeing where I'm getting a clock on this thing. This, there's a pad there, a test point marked clock. I'm not getting anything on that. Now I'm getting that, that side of that crystal is oscillating. Yeah, so I'm getting a good oscillation on that side of the crystal. So unfortunately, it looks like I've got to either check this, check this inverter, see if it's working properly, uh, or I'm gonna have to figure out exactly how that is wired in there. But it, you know, it's fairly common to just use that little inverter uh, and the crystal to to create a square wave. And there is one component missing. There's an R3 here that's missing. So that R3, that looks like it's connected to that crystal. Okay, so I'm gonna have to figure out this little part of this circuit because I don't have a clock. If you don't have a clock, well, no, wait a sec, now I got a perfect clock. What in the world was that? Something, now I got a perfect clock, yeah. See, look at that, it's a perfect square wave there. 500 nanosecond per division. So yeah, that's a perfect clock. That's exactly what I should have. Okay, so that's good, but I need to find out why. I'm gonna reset these chips. So let me take these chips out, 
re-socket them. Maybe it just had a bad socket or something. Uh, or maybe that resistor is needed to kickstart this. Let me turn it off again and power it back up again. Yeah, it, there's no clock there. But, okay, something here is needed to kickstart this because if I turn the power supply off, turn it back on, see there's nothing. Can you see that? Yeah, turn the power supply off, there's nothing. But if I put my finger on something there, I can kickstart that clock. So let me do that again. Turn it off. Turn it back on. Nothing. But I can touch. I can touch where that resistor is supposed to be, and I'll, the clock will kickstart. So I think that resistor is supposed to be there. So the good news is I figured out how to start the clock. The bad news is that means this board has probably never operated. And I'm really hoping this was a product and not just you know vaporware that never actually shipped. Because if that's the case, well, there could be mistakes on this board. Maybe this board never actually worked because Without that, it's unlikely this clock was going. Without these jumpers, if there aren't pull-ups on that Z80 to take it out of a wait state, uh, it's possible that Z80 was never actually going. So let's still give this the benefit of the doubt. Still trying to track down any information. It says that this was sold. It said this was you know, being marketed. It showed up for a couple of years. So I got to believe, and this was fairly late uh, date. I had... This, the magazine article was in December of, when was that magazine article? The magazine article was November of 1980, and this board was, you know, made in 44th week of 1980. So it was made just right at the time that that article came out. Okay, so I got a little bit of homework to do. I'm going to find out, look at this whole circuit, but I'm guessing that I need to put in a, oh, there's a, that's not a, that, that's a 10 M. I was looking at that upside down. It makes sense. That's probably a 10 mega ohm resistor. Let me put a 10 mega ohm in the re resistor there. Figure out what this part of the circuit is doing and then get back with you. All right. So I traced that little circuit out for this oscillator and the crystal and see what they're doing here. And this is the circuit I get. So basically, this is our crystal. This is this little diode here that they must just used to clip it or you know crowbar this to make sure that it stays under five volts i guess this is the bias resistor that is missing this r3 looks like it's supposed to be a 10 mega ohm resistor this bias is this and uh, then you can see the the clock just goes through one two three inverters back to the clock so this seems like a bit of overkill rather than just using one but they have three of them and then they come out and they have two of these inverters that are driving this clock pad here, which is actually the clock that goes up to that. So this is what they've got on that. They're using five of the six inverters in that little CMOS chip. And so you can see what they're doing here. And it's, it's I don't think that's, I think that's fairly standard. Uh, I'm not sure that that diode was necessary, but this, this, bias resistor. This resistor R3 is certainly necessary to kick this, kickstart this thing and keep it in the, the improperly biased and keep this thing going. So R3 does need to get installed. I'm going to put a 10 mega ohm in that. But while I was ohming this out, I noticed that there was one gate. I came across the other gate that wasn't being used in this circuit. So I tracked it back to see what it was doing. And interestingly enough, We'll come back to this later, probably. I'm not sure why they're doing this, but the refresh coming out of the Z80. So you remember the Z80 has a circuit in it that when it does, every time it does an opcode fetch, it refreshes your dynamic RAM if you have it on the board. And we don't have any dynamic RAM on this board. So they take the refresh, run it through an inverter, and then they run it into the uh, 4 to 16 decoder, this 74154 as the G2 enable. So basically what that does is that when this is undergoing a refresh so that this is low, so when you know it pulls the opcode and while it's setting that up, it does a refresh for one of the addresses in memory 
and when it's doing that refresh, it pulls the refresh line low. That would then take this high, and G2 would go high, and G2 is the second input. And let me confirm that G2 is actually active low. Yeah, these are both active low. So this is G2, this is active low, G2. Okay, so what this does is when this is undergoing a refresh, it disables this decoder so that none of the addresses can be decoded. I need to look at this, read about that a bit more, and maybe trace out some more on the schematic because I'm just not sure why that refresh is necessary. I saw they brought it out to a pad here, but they're actually using it to disable all of the memory. But when the Z80 does a refresh, I don't think it does a read or a write strobe while it's doing a refresh. So, so nobody that's out here would get a read or a write while it's doing a refresh. So that must be a shortcut for something. There's, there must be something else that they're doing here that I just don't, it's not coming to mind. But at any rate, we'll, we'll go, we're going back to presuming that that's going to work on this board. All right, so let me go ahead and put that resistor in to make sure that this clock fires up. This is hooked up to the logic analyzer. And also I have the, this little oscilloscope on the M1 uh, output of the Z80. So if we look at what I'm, what I'm interested in right now is, does this Z80 start clocking and, and fetching instructions as soon as it powers up? I put the resistor in, so I'm now getting a good steady clock on the input to the Z80. So that was the problem with that put that in, it fixed the problem with the clock. So now I'm getting a good clock input, that's six, nice square wave. And there's a few things here that we talked about that can stop this from working. If the reset is held low, that'll keep the processor in reset. If the bus request is low, it thinks that somebody else wants the bus and so it'll try state everything. If the weight is low, that will cause it to stop fetching instructions and just hold into its last state. So if any of these are incorrect, then the processor won't take off. And of course, if the uh, interrupt or the non-maskable interrupt is low, then it would go off and be servicing those interrupts. So really there's you know like five lines here that have to be in the right position. Let's look at M1. M1 is a useful little line on the Z80. What M1 tells us is every time it's going to fetch an opcode, M1 will go low. So if we see M1 toggling, we know that it's going out and it's fetching opcode. We don't know if it's getting anything. It could just be getting crap, but we know that it's at least trying to fetch an opcode. So when we're working with this Z80, the first thing we want to do is see if M1 is toggling, meaning that it's going out and it's, it's the first T state that's what M1 stands for. It's the first machine state. So if M1 goes low, it means it's fetching instructions. So let's power up and look at the logic analyzer. And this is what we're seeing. We, we see that the refresh is high. And so that's kind of a first indication that we're not getting any opcode fetches because the refresh, remember it'll fetch an opcode and then it'll do a refresh. So since the refresh isn't going low, that's also an indication that uh, it's not fetching anything. M1 is high, so it's not fetching. Clock is oscillating. We can see the important ones here, the weight is low. So that means that this is being held in a weight state and the bus request is low. So this processor obviously isn't doing anything because it thinks somebody else wants to control the bus and because it's in a weight state. Okay, this guy is also hooked up to the M1. So we're seeing M1 in the red trace. Power is on. And we don't see, if we, when we first do a reset on this, so this is a power off, power on, we're not really seeing anything on that. It's not going through some clocking and then stopping. So I'm going to apply the finger test. The finger test is those four jumpers that, there we go. I put my finger on those four jumpers, which remember they have got, uh, three of them have five volts on one side and then the weight the bus request on the other side. And I saw for a second there where it started oscillating. So I'm gonna do the wet finger test, which is 
a more advanced finger test. There we go. Okay, so now we can see that I put my finger on that and it started oscillating. So with my finger on those, I'm pulling the weight, the bus request, and the reset out of their halt values. So this processor then started. Now let's look at the waveforms on the logic analyzer. Okay, and this is what we've got. See, so look at this. So now we can see this processor immediately popped up. We've got M1. So we're pulling op codes here. Uh, the bus request is high. The weight is high. The chip select, that's U4 chip select. Oh, I don't have that actually connected up yet. So that's why that one's low. So now we can see we've still got our clock, but now the weight is high. The bus request is high. We're pulling op codes. M1 is toggling just the way that it should. The refresh is toggling all the time. And we're getting reads. And we can see if we look at the address lines, we're getting some, some changes in the address. I'm not quite sure if it's sequencing up, but we're getting changes of the addressing. So this answers our questions. And I, I went back and I looked at the text for the Z80, and it describes those inputs for the weight and the bus request. And it says that normally those would be a wired OR, and they would include a pull-up. So certainly these guys have to have a pull-up uh, or be hardwired up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to power this back down, and I'm going to put resistors to pull those lines up and also uh, on the jumper four for that reset. Okay, so let me go ahead and put those resistors in. Let me power off, put those resistors in, and we'll come back. Okay, those resistors are in, and let me show you what I did there. So I basically, I just put in a jumper on the reset, and then I put little stand up on their end resistors for the bus signals. Now the reason I put in resistors for the bus signals is because I may in fact someday, you know, if I really take a liking to this board and can find a card cage for it, I may actually build some other boards to go along with it. And so someday I may want to be able to use these as a wired OR and have somebody actually make a bus request so forth. So I put these in as resistors. These are 2.2K resistors. Uh, I could have just put jumpers in that if I had no intention of ever using those from another board. Okay, so I put those in, and one thing that's interesting, I forgot to mention before, was if we look at this article from the uh, interface age, it says unit prices start at $28.50 for the bare board, $69 for a kit, and $185 for the fully assembled and tested boards. So this came as a kit, or as just a bare board. So I think that maybe this board was never actually operated before. It didn't have those jumpers. It didn't have that resistor uh, to even get the clock going. So unless they sat with this thing and constantly applied their finger to that spot, I don't know how they had this board going. So my guess is that this is actually the first time that this board has ever run, which is you know, amazing. Here we are 40 years later. Uh, I've had this, I think, for about five years. You pulled it off the shelf and, you know, the first time that it runs. Okay, so, well, I guess maybe I'm being overconfident. I haven't actually run it yet. Let me put this clip back on, and so it's ready to start running some software. We'll do that in the next video. I think it's a good time to break this one. Uh, I think we finished the hardware. At least I hope we have. I think we've got everything going at this point. We've got the clock going. We know we got the processor going. So now let's see if we can go out and fetch some op codes, and we'll do that in the next video. So I hope you got something out of this. I appreciate your comments, and if you have anything else you want to see, let me know. Talk with you later. Bye-bye.